We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, and I'm a partnerships manager here at All Voices. And today we have our next guest, Michelle, also Giordano. Um, she is the Vice President of Digital Services at the Digital Crisis at the Charlie Project. Project. Hi, Michelle. How's it going? Good. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. If you wanted to tell us a little bit about yourself for the folks who are uh, listening, including your pronouns, and what has recently brought you joy, anything in the world? Sure. Um, well, thanks so much for having me. I'm Michelle Giordano, the VP of Digital Crisis Services at the Trevor Project. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, recently, what's brought me joy is walking my son, who is seven, to school again. Um, for so many people, Folks, you know, this pandemic has brought so much change to the way we lived and um, had our sort of daily routines. And so being able to simply walk my son to school again has really brought me joy um, and to see how excited he is to be back in the classroom. That's awesome. That's funny. Someone else said that the other day. And it's just like it's a really nice like way to like start the day and just also spend time together. So I love I love that answer. Um, let's start out with the with the why. You have a lot of experience at really mission driven organizations, including places like Girls Who Code. What really brought you to the Trevor Project? So yes, um, I've always been connected to social justice work and started my career as an activist in HIV and AIDS prevention. In college, I also came out. So as part of the LGBTQ community, um, I've always known about the Trevor Project. I've been a big fan. I've followed its work for a long time. Um, and so on top of that, I've very, very much have been interested in how do we really reach people in a, in a broader way. And so the Trevor Project really thinking about how to reach LGBTQ youth nationally was very compelling to me, especially during a pandemic when we know so many young people live in such a diverse um, amount of communities that you know we could really be there for them in a profound way. So the urgency felt um, really strong at this point in time. And so when I knew I could have the opportunity to join the organization, I of course jumped for it. That's amazing. I've also known about the Trevor Project for a while and it sounds like there's a really personal tie for you there. And I imagine that a lot of folks that work there also feel the same way towards the mission and that contributes to really the workplace and company culture as well. Um, could you tell us like what it's like to work there and what the company culture is uh, with your peers and teammates? Yeah, sure. So company culture is so important. And I think, um, you know, with the last year, having to really be intentional about it has really been brought to the forefront because, you know, the traditional ways of thinking about culture um, in, in an in-office experience, um, is quickly gone when you had to sort of transition your staff. So, you know, for Trevor, I would say we're really, really centered on empathy and innovation and community. And those are the pillars that really drive a lot of our decisions and the way we think about the work. We have a team that is across the country that mm -hmm. come from all diverse communities and um, have so many different talents and really being able to encourage people to you know, show up as who they are, contribute to the organization in a way that resonates with their own values and why they've been brought to Trevor. Um, and also within that really thinking through how do we continue to push ourselves to be innovative and think about the way we can leverage tech to reach more young LGBTQ people and, and really sort of create that um, innovation culture within the organization at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like a lot of organizations are having to think about adaptability over this past year, and especially for this, just the services and community that Trevor offers as well. I know I was talking with your with your team, and one of the kind of main elements is the digital crisis services that's 24-7. So phone, text, chat, and a lot of work depends on volunteers and counselors. And in a regular year, it is, it is a lot of emotional work as well. And then we also have just mental health during the pandemic. How do you really think about supporting kind of the mental health of your, uh, your folks there? 
Yeah, I mean, I I would say we probably think about it more than most organizations because yeah. it's our it's our you know focus and why we exist, and we do this in a few ways. I mean, I think first and foremost, one of the ways we do it is that we we are ta- we're talking about it all the time. It's mm-hmm. we're very transparent about it. We really encourage our colleagues and our staff to talk about whatever is happening in their own lives, specifically to mental health. Of course, with within that, respecting people's boundaries and the way they want to show up with that in the workplace. So we're, you know, we're constantly balancing that, right? Creating that culture of like Kent, talking about your, whatever is happening for you along your mental health experience, um, but also making sure we have the right resources and support for that. So in terms of our programming, we do a lot around case conferencing and process groups and really talking about the, the work itself and how that's impacting people day to day. When you're serving LGBTQ youth in crisis, that can often be really heavy for people, um, especially if they're already grappling with issues or, or challenges in their own life. So we always want to create space for that to process the work. We also have supervisors on our lines 24 seven who are there supporting our counselors and crisis workers through conversations. So that's a, an extra layer for us of making sure that if there's a difficult conversation with a young person and someone needs to debrief on it, um, that we have the right support in place. And then we have organizational policies um, in place like EAP programs and extended leave of absences and, and ways that we really can encourage people to, when they need to step away from the work, to have that opportunity, when they need extra resources to know that you know we will provide it for them. And then for that to be a real sort of center point for them to know how they can sustain themselves in the role and make sure they're taking care of their wellness. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like there are a ton of resources and just intentionality behind it as well, like you said, because of the nature of the work. Um, And you mentioned kind of organizational processes as well. Are there any other kind of shifts that the team has made uh, throughout the pandemic um, for, you know, for the better there? Yeah, so, you know, before my time, the organization had to make a really quick pivot to become 100% remote. That Mm -hmm. was really critical to do for our lifeline services where we knew we had to take our phone lines and figure out how to make them remote um, without interrupting our 24 seven service. So I'm really, it's in, incredibly inspiring to hear how the de- team did that. It was across, you know, um, functional effort as it always is in organizations and companies. And, you know, I think the opportunity that it's allowed us is to really be able to leverage, um, you know, talent across the country and also think about our operations without it being anchored in, in, you know, certain regions and locations in the country. And so in a lot of ways, I think there's been some great benefits um, from it. You know, we've been able to realize that we can do this work anywhere at any time um, and continue to serve LGBTQ youth in crisis um, in, in the way we have always done. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've been hearing that too from just these conversations of the opportunity for accessibility to these roles, but also just the services overall, um, which is really great. And you mentioned supervisors um, and you lead the digital crisis like services team. Mm -hmm. Um, I would love to ask, you know, have you seen the role of managers, especially who are, you know, motivating and talking with people um, throughout this time, and, you know, you might not have met your manager in person. Have you seen their kind of roles change um, over this past year? And if so, like how? Yeah, this is a really good question. And I think as a leader, you've had to change or you couldn't Mm -hmm. be successful for your team. So I've never met my team in person. I've never met my direct boss in in person. And I think, um, you know, with the way we've been able to transition remotely, the it's uh, really amazing to me that we've been able to connect and really be successful together in the way we think about the work. But as a leader, you've had to create more space for understanding people's personal lives, right? Like we've always talked about work life balance and boundaries in the workplace and how to think about that in relation to managing a team. But when I came into the role, what was really important for me was to really sort of name all of the things that were happening in the world and really creating a space for people to talk about that in their lives. We know we know folks that you know um, were impacted by COVID either themselves or by family members, or were you know making big decisions on how they um, needed to relocate to be closer to family for the unique needs that were coming up during the pandemic. Also, just the social and emotional and mental stress on yourself and your community during a pandemic 
has impacted people so differently. And you, it's really important as a leader to know where your people are at with that journey and understand that each person is responding differently and to take in those needs. So, you know, I feel like I know more about my team than I probably <laughs> would have because of the pandemic. Cause we've had yeah. to ask really tough questions and be really honest about, you know, what is happening in our lives and how we're feeling um, and naming that and, you know, and making sure that people have space to talk about it because it does impact the work and the way you feel like you can show up day to day. And you want people to have space for that, especially if, you know, they're, they're really feeling the direct impact of a pandemic. Um, you know, you really need to be able to name that and make it part of the way you're thinking about your team. Yeah, absolutely. Naming it and meeting employees and just like team members where they are. I know like some folks have cried on Zoom for the first time and they're just like, I don't want to share on like this hundred person Zoom meeting, but I want to talk to you directly one-on-one. So I think that's like super important as well. I want to kind of shift to all of the amazing research that is done at Trevor as well. Um, I know that, you know, you've run the largest national survey on LGBTQ youth, um, specifically in regards to mental health in 2020. And there was a lot that came out of that, but I want to kind of know for folks who are listening, um, you know, what are some key insights folks should be aware of, especially um, as we're thinking about, you know, the new world of work and really building an inclusive and equitable space where folks can succeed. Yeah, um, thank you so much. It's always um, so wonderful to talk about what we're seeing in the research. Um, and I'm so proud of Trevor and my colleagues that do this work, because I think it is really important to recognize what is happening for the LGBTQ youth. So this is what we know, which is that 42% of LGBTQ youth seriously consider attempting suicide and have in the past year. And we know that more than half of transgender and non-binary youth um, are part of that. And 70% of LGBTQ youth have stated that their mental health is poor most of the time or always during COVID. Um, yet nearly half of LGBTQ youth could not access the mental health care they desire. So, you know, those are pretty high percentages and we mm -hmm. know we have a lot of work to do there. I think the good news is that the research keeps pointing us to the same solutions, which are that affirming spaces and support systems actually do save young LGBTQ lives. So LGBTQ youth who had access to these spaces actually had you know, people affirm their sexual orientation and gender identity mm -hmm. did report lower rates of attempting suicide. Um, for transgender and non-binary youth, um, you know, they will attempt suicide less when respect mm -hmm. is given to their pronouns and they are officially um, able to change their legal documents. So, you know, we know what works and we really need to do more of it. And, you know, um, it's really important for youth who are not in supportive families or homes to be able to get that affirmation in other spaces, whether it's school or with community organizations or with a, a teacher, we know like one affirming adult will actually make a huge change in a young LGBTQ person's life. And so that is one of the key reasons why we exist and, and, and we do this research. And I think if we're transitioning it to the workplace, you know, we can really think through, you know, how do you create an LGBTQ affirming workspace? Um, you know, we know that it makes a big difference for people. And, you know, in our research, only 36% of LGBTQ youth describe their workplace um, as LGBTQ friendly. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of ways for us to improve on that. You know, how do we think about having LGBTQ friendly protocols and, and policies that you're putting at the forefront of your organization, um, you know, really sort of centering, centering around trans day of visibility, trans day of remembrance, um, you know, and, and pride month, you know, how are you going to think about elevating the LGBTQ youth community or your um, staff, you know, where this actually can make a difference for them. And then, you know, really thinking about LGBTQ based discrimination in the workplace, you know, what are the pathways for people to really be able to talk about that um, and, and to be able to feel like they're going to be safe if they report on that. So I think there are many ways to tackle the problem and to think about, you know, the research we're doing and then how to implement that that can really, really change, you know, the, the course of an experience for someone who is an LGBTQ young person. 
Absolutely. I appreciate what you kind of shared around the affirming spaces and the affirmation of one person and just support system as well is so important. And I know a lot of organizations are, you mentioned just pronouns and adding pronouns to just email signatures and um, just making, you know, what looks like small adjustments, but the data that you shared of just transgender and non-binary youth, like having their pronouns respected just lowers suicide rates or attempted to, it's just I, I think that's really important. And a lot of folks maybe don't know that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and just thinking about building trans inclusive spaces in an organization is super important. So celebrating trans day of visibility and just really making sure that it's part of the culture is so important. Um, is there a, this is more of a personal question for you, but is there any surprising kind of factor or point of information about you that folks would be like, oh, I didn't know that about Michelle? Uh, I, this is a tough question, but I did, um, you know, I did want to talk about what was surprising about me that brought me to this work, which is that my dad died of AIDS when I was 18. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, feel very connected to the social movements, specifically with the HIV and AIDS activists who came before me um, and put in a lot of the groundwork for the LGBTQ community as well. Um, but really personally, like when I went through that experience, it really was the catalyst for me wanting to be part of social justice work, social change, and really thinking about how stigma and shame and discrimination really can take a toll and create unique risk factors in people's lives. And so for me, that, you know, that experience grounds me day to day in, in the work I'm doing. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's so deeply personal as well. And I feel like that's a lot of motivation of what we've talked about too. Um, And I'm sure that you have kind of many of them, but over the past few months, whether it's a big milestone or small, do you have a proudest moment working at Trevor? Uh, Yeah. I mean, I would say um, one of my proudest moments is when, you know, we've been able to really continue 24 seven during a pandemic, despite like all of the ups and downs of people's lives and transitions and moves. Um, You know, that has been really incredible. I would say like also during, you know, the election, um, you know, we knew a lot of youth were coming to us around anxieties and fears about how, you know, the election would impact them. And we were able to put out a um, guide to our staff and sort of how to talk through some of the questions they were getting from young people who were feeling so anxious and stressful. And so, you know, I'm proud of how we responded as a team to the pandemic, but I'm also really proud of how we've been able to respond to youth, right? Like we are always operating in real time, right? You know, taking the context of the world and what's happening socially, culturally, politically, and bringing that into our work to really meet young people where they're at. And I, you know, we're, I think we're really unique in the way we do that. Absolutely. And I think it's so important to take what's going on in the world and, you know, think about how your impact makes a difference, especially in the lives of young people as well, who do have a lot of questions and are seeking answers and support, again, affirming spaces. So I think that's really important um, as well. Um, I know that we talked about a couple kind of different topics in terms of your journey to Trevor and just the work that is, is happening in real time now, but is there anything else that you would like to share with folks who are listening um, or just reemphasize kind of a point that you hope that they take away from our conversation today? Yeah, I would say be an ally, you know, um, you know, look at the different workplaces you're in in your communities and really be an advocate to trans youth and LGBTQ youth and push for people to introduce themselves with their pronouns and to be really vocal about supporting trans youth. I think we need to say it more and we need to do it more. And so wherever you can be that person championing, um, you can see it, you know, you'll see a difference. Um, I also would say, you know, refer um, to Trevor, you know, if you know that there's a youth in need, like, please don't be shy about asking um, a family member or a teacher to use our resources. We have our Trevor Lifeline. We also have our Trevor um, text and chat. And so, you know, I really would encourage people to, you know, let young people know we are there for them. You know, make sure that if you have a young LGBTQ person in your life, you let them know they can reach us 24 um, seven because we want to be there for them, um, you know, in, in their moment of crisis and making sure that they know that they can talk to a supportive counselor. 
Absolutely. I think that's so important. And oftentimes folks are thinking they don't have the answers and they don't know where to go, but there are folks like at the Trevor Project who have a bunch of different resources that you can just go to and also just direct uh, young people to as well. So I think that is a great uh, call to action for everyone who is listening. Michelle, thank you so much for speaking with us this morning. I it was so it was so nice to meet you and uh, just talk about all of the amazing work you're doing and your personal connection to it. Same. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And as a reminder for the folks who are listening, All Voices really believes in the empowerment of everyone speaking out in an organization um, and think it's a requirement for everyone to succeed. Speak soon.